irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to Get Yourself the Job with Jennifer Hill, only on LA Talk Radio. Well, happy Monday, everybody, and thank you so much for tuning in to Get Yourself the Job with Jennifer Hill. Today's show is brought to you by J. Hill Staffing Services, a division of Markham Search. And today we have with us on the show Sharon Schweitzer. Sharon is the founder of Access to Culture and an award-winning entrepreneur, accredited in intercultural management by the Hofstede Center in Helsinki, Finland. She advises and trains current and emerging leaders in global 2000 organizations and universities to improve business communications and increase revenue. She is an internationally recognized cross-cultural business expert, trainer, speaker, and author of the Amazon number one best-selling book in international business, Access to Asia, named to Kirkus Review's Best Books of 2015. She's received the prestigious recognition of being the small business winner of the British Airways International Trade Award at the 2016 Greater Austin Business Awards. She was the 2009 honoree in the City of Austin program, celebrating the entrepreneurial spirit of Austin women. In September 2017, her blog, Access to Culture, was named one of the top 10 intercultural communication blogs. She's also a media resource for NPR, BBC World News, is a Huffington Post and Lux Lifestyle magazine contributor, and has been quoted in Investors Business Daily, BBC Capital, Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and numerous other media outlets. Sharon has worked with brands such as CBS, Hilton Hotels, J.P. Morgan, Lexus, M.D. Anderson, Toyota, various sports athletes and student leaders to provide practical techniques for improving business communications and increasing revenue. She is a graduate of the Ohio State University with a B.A. in sociology and a Juris Doctorate from South Texas College of Law, Houston. She sits on the board of Global Thinkers Forum in London, UK, and has traveled to all seven seven continents in over 80 countries as well, and still counting. She lives with her husband, John, of 20 plus years and their golden retriever, Toffee, in Austin, Texas. Thank you so much for being with us today, Sharon. It's my pleasure, Jennifer. I'm delighted to be with you and your listeners. I love this topic. So today we're going to be talking about how important is etiquette in the business world, whether we're talking about going into an interview or whether we're talking about what's appropriate to wear in the workplace, how we're perceived has a lot to do with our personal and professional brand. So why don't you start by telling our listeners a little bit about how this became a passion of yours and how you became an expert in this subject? Well, as the daughter of a military officer, and a nurse. I, as I grew up, I learned very quickly and very early that appearance and manners and protocol were very important to success. And so I have followed that throughout my life. I also attended the Protocol School of Washington um, after I had been practicing law for about 15 years because a client found out that they were going to need to know some very specific things in order to be successful with a client from France. And so they needed to know some very particular things about how to conduct themselves. They were used to doing things in the U.S. and all of a sudden they were going to be um, critiqued and doing deals with some French folks. And they needed to make sure that their appearance, their wardrobe, the way they presented themselves and the first impressions that they presented were going to be appropriate. So you learn things very early in life about how to present yourself, how important etiquette and protocol are, and how much just what you wear signals things so crucially. You know, the brain picks things up immediately about how we present ourselves. It's so true. I know in the interviewing world, people say that you can be sized up even in as quickly as the first five seconds. And I think that it's almost this unconscious, subconscious, reactionary thing that do I relate to this person? Do I like this person? Is this person safe for me to be around? And it's in it's maybe even our reptilian brain that assesses that within a moment of meeting somebody. 
That's right. That is so right, Jennifer. Recently, there have been some studies in neuroscience that have uh, shown us that the brain actually now is making a decision nine seconds before we even consciously realize our brain has made that decision about whether we trust someone, what their competence level are, whether that person is going to hurt us or help us. And so we don't even know the brain's already decided, and it's all based on what that person looks like. And you're right, it is the reptilian brain stem, and it goes back to fight or flight. Yeah, and it's it's so funny because on both sides of it, say if you're in an interview situation, both parties are sizing each other up when they meet. Yes, on the one hand, if you're going into interview, you certainly want to make a good impression, but I think that the onus is also equally as important on the person representing the company because we had somebody once upon a time who was going into interview with a particular organization, and the person who they were interviewing with was slovenly, disheveled, looked like this person had just rolled out of bed and it completely tarnished what the applicant thought of that company and in turn it actually hurt our brand as well that we were representatives of this organization and so it's funny that it also has an equal and opposite effect when you are the employer or the potential employee joining the company that's right because these applicants and We've, we have so many applicants and so many interns and millennials that come through our office, and these folks go on to work with very prestigious organizations, and when we get the calls for the reference checks, and then these individuals end up working on Wall Street, they end up working in very high-end positions, and then they get asked, well, tell us about your prior employment, and that is so important to have a good reliable reference and to have someone say, oh, you know, this organization is very well regarded. I had a very good experience there because let's face it, it's all relationship based. And a lot of it is reputation management based on word of mouth. Absolutely. And so let's talk about etiquette for a moment, because I think when I first got the press release about etiquette, it kind of brings back those memories of, you know, perhaps if you heard about uh, what was that training school where uh, perhaps a man or a woman would go to, what is, what is the concept I'm thinking of, that formalized training school where you learn how to drink your tea properly and what foods to eat with which fork. So we think of etiquette, or at least I personally thought of etiquette in that way, but I feel like it's kind of a misnomer because etiquette really extends far beyond the appropriate uh, manners at a dinner table, right? <laughs> yes, you're probably thinking of the concept of finishing school. That's or the word I was even... looking for, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. A lot of people think that etiquette is something that is stuffy or you're holding your little finger out uh, when you drink tea. But in reality, etiquette is really about three things. It's about, uh, number one, kindness. It's also about empathy and it's about integrity and honesty in your interactions with others. It's about whether other people feel comfortable in your presence or not. And so if you're an authentic person and you express yourself in a way that others say, hey, you know what? I just had the greatest conversation with Jennifer and I really want to be around her more. She is so pleasant then obviously you have nice etiquette. You have social graces. It's those people who you're in their presence and you think, oh, I didn't get a good feeling. I really don't want to be around that person. That is someone who probably doesn't have good etiquette. And today we even call it modern manners. You know, a lot of people don't like the word etiquette or they're not as comfortable. And so a lot of folks today will even say modern manners, but it's it's the same concept. It's how comfortable are you when you're doing business, you're at lunch, or you're even out on a social scene. So let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, if we're talking about etiquette and we're talking about manners, it is that something that you can train? Is that something like, say, for example, if you have somebody who is socially awkward or inappropriate or makes other people uncomfortable when they're around them, and it could be for a multitude of reasons, is that something that you think somebody can learn or is it innate? It depends on their motivation. 
if they really want to learn and they really want to improve themselves, then yes, absolutely they can learn. Some people grow up uh, with a set of, you know, parents or a mother or a father or a grandparent or some someone influential in their lives who has taught them, you know, these are the appropriate ways to behave, this, these are manners, or they may read a book, or they may decide, I want, you know, they have that drive and that ambition where they want to do well and they want to climb that ladder. And so if that's the case, then yes, they have that type of motivation. So you don't necessarily have to decide, you know, that, oh, I can't possibly have manners. Manners are free. They don't cost anything. You don't have to go to finishing school to have manners. Uh, you, you know, the Internet is not expensive. You, It's free. You can get out there and, and go to the public library. You can go many places and read about different styles of manners. So... Do you think a lot of people are aware of how they come across to others? Or do you think, well, I'll leave you with that question. Do you think that people are conscious of how they occur for other people? I think that some people do have good self-awareness, but I think a lot of people don't. And they don't understand necessarily how they come across. They may not realize that impressions are important. I think sometimes when people travel outside the U.S. or they meet uh, folks from other countries who are coming into the U.S. to do business, they are a little surprised because they find that their wardrobe is a little lacking. Recently, I visited with someone who had gone to China to do business and wore flip-flops. And oh, no. they were from a southern state. And they said, you know, people are really looking at me funny. Um, but they thought since they lived in a, you know, the U.S. can be more informal. And they didn't, I don't think, understand that the concept of business in China, how you, you present yourself, especially your shoes, are crucial because it's a sign of how well you take care of your feet and that is crucial in China. How you walk the streets, which they consider to be very filthy and dirty, how you protect your feet from that. Um, the feet are considered the dirtiest part of the body. And so for someone to wear flip-flops um, is just incredible to the Chinese. And so that person had a real difficult time with the business, which to someone who knows the culture would be understandable. So you know, depending on what you would wear to an interview in the U.S. or try to get a job in the U.S., you may try to wear something that an interviewer may think, oh, my gosh, that is so inappropriate, while it may be something that in your casual wardrobe you're very comfortable in but just isn't quite the right fit for that organization or that culture. Yeah, it's a great point you raise. I remember years ago, there was a more conservative law firm that we recruited for, and similar situation, again, culturally, to my knowledge, nobody there was from China, but they were really offended by the fact that somebody did show up, and I don't know if it was flip-flops, but I think it was open-toed sandaled shoes, and despite the fact that on paper, she was absolutely perfect for this particular position, she was immediately disqualified. Now, ironically, I'm sure you could speak to this as well, if we're talking about a startup or a Silicon Beach or one of those techie companies, like for example, in my husband's industry in technology and entertainment, you would be given side eye if you showed up in a full suit and, you know, and a pair of loafers or something to that extent, because you would just be out of place in that company culture. So I think an important tip here is to know your audience. So tell us a little bit about that. How do you know your audience, whether it's a business meeting, an interview, how can you do good due diligence to make sure you're not in an embarrassing situation? Well, you, you bring up a really good point. And one of the most important things I think is that you need to understand the organizational culture. For example, the law firm. More than half of all U.S. workplaces have a dress code. And in the last decade, in the U.S., office wardrobe has become far more relaxed and more casual. And as you mentioned, in certain professions, and I know a lot of the listeners 
can think of immediately the creative professions, design, um, fashion, they are going to be more relaxed and more casual. Whereas the industries like the finance and banking, um, legal and professional consulting, they are going to be far more highly conservative. So if you're in the fashion industry, you're going to wear current yet more appropriate fashion. So how do you figure that out? Well, you definitely want to research the client before the meeting to determine what are their preferences. Do they have designated days? You know, sometimes it's not always a casual Friday. It may be a different day. And I encourage my clients and I would encourage the listeners to check the online presence of that particular organization or that particular client. Look at photos and annual reports. Look at the social media, for example, Instagram postings, Facebook, Twitter, and go through and look at how they're posting and spend some time. Don't just look for a few minutes, but sit down and really take the time to look over you know, a period of time at how they're posting. What do these events look like? What do the meetings look like? Um, if you can, the other thing that's a really good idea is go by the office, sit outside, mm. over to the side, and watch what are people wearing there going in and outside the office. Yeah, that's a great piece of advice. I wouldn't have thought of that before because, again, it's something so simple. Like, what if it's your dream job, the job you've always wanted, and something so silly like wearing a sundress instead of a business dress or having bare shoulders instead of wearing a sweater or a jacket over you, or even in a man's case, maybe wearing too loud of a tie or too bright of a suit or not wearing a suit. All of those are things that could lose you your ideal job or if you're in a business setting, your big you know, goal or your big corporate account that you're trying to land. So I love that idea of sitting outside and kind of just doing your due diligence and checking out what sort of culture does it seem like this company has. The other thing that really helps is we, um, what, one of the things I used to do was I used to see if I could find out the organization's dress code policy. So as an attorney, I interviewed with a number of law firms. And so I would call the firm and say, you know, I'm in, I'm interviewing with a number of firms. Yours is one of the firms I'm interviewing with. Would you be able to share your firm's dress code policy? And many times they would say, oh, yes, absolutely. Here's what we ask our attorneys to wear. And they wanted to tell me, here's what we do not like. Here's what we really like. Here's what we want to see. And they will they are more than happy to tell you because they like that. Now, if you're hesitant about doing that, see if you can find a trusted inside coach to tell you. And if you're already working in the job, let's say it's your first day, your first week, and you're brand new and you really want to do well on the job, then what you're going to want to do is go find a seasoned team lead or someone that everyone seems to really regard well and watch what they wear. Look at what they're wearing and be very observant and make sure that you follow suit and you're not wearing something that's, you know, the opposite end of the spectrum. You want to make sure that you are following not only the written policy, but the unwritten policy, because there may be some things that are absolutely prohibited that aren't written in the policy, but, you know, Bob got in trouble for last week because he came in and he didn't wear flip-flops, but he wore sandals. And open-toed shoes for men are absolutely taboo in this workplace. You can wear polos, you can wear casual shirts, but absolutely no open-toed shoes for men. Well, it doesn't really say that in the policy, but unless you knew the unwritten rules, you might make that mistake. Yeah, and you don't even realize sometimes what's expected or what's not expected of you. And I think it's just like anything else. Every company has a brand, has a culture. And it's not to say, in some cases, we just had this happen recently where a very, very, very traditional old school law firm 
uh, gave the person on their first day a handout that said you are expected to wear only closed-toed shoes, stockings with a uh, blouse or skirt or pants. If you are wearing a skirt, you need to wear stockings. And that was an extreme example. And the person was really culturally shocked by that. And it wound up not being the right long-term fit for her because it's not to say that you're bad or wrong if you go to a place and they have extremely stringent rules or regulations. It's just something you have to ask yourself, is this culturally going to be in line with what I value, what my core values are? And one thing to think about, too, that I don't know if you've noticed this, Sharon, but I've noticed that with uh, corporations or law firms or professional services companies that are based on the East Coast, most of the time, if you're dealing with a company based in Boston, New York, et cetera, their policies tend to err on the side of being more conservative than if you're dealing with perhaps a California-based company. It's not always the case, but it seems to have been true in a lot of the cases where we've dealt with people with offices on the East Coast as opposed to their main office being here. Jennifer, you are so right, and that is so true, yes, because I don't know that there are any silk stocking firms left on the West Coast. There (laughs) may be a few. There may be. Maybe at the London office, you know, of of, uh, a firm, maybe have an office in California, but even then, I think once they've lived in California for, uh, you know, a couple years, I think the silk stockings are going to fall to the wayside and they're called silk stocking law firms for a reason. <laughs> and I was a mem- I was a member of a silk stocking law firm and what you're describing is absolutely 100% correct. So you have your silk stocking law firms and then you have the other law firms that, where you don't have to dress in that way. And if you're going to interview and you want to work for a top tier law firm, you have to expect and you have to know that you're going to spend a lot of money on your wardrobe. And if you want that prestige, it's going to go to your wardrobe and your clothing too, because you, that's just what's expected. And so I'm sure they did give her that memo and I'm sure they gave the men something similar. But in New York um, and on the wet, the East Coast, um, the wardrobe and the attire is much more formal and it's very different. I think the weather is also different. And so you're going to see that they're going to wear the stockings and the tights and the, the things that cover the legs far more frequently than you are on the West Coast. But I think it's also a culture. It's a different culture. So let's talk, speaking of culture, let's talk about cross-cultural situations. You never know who's going to be sitting opposite you in a meeting, in a interview, in any sort of professional or even a personal setting. How can somebody be prepared to be culturally sensitive, no matter who they're interviewing with or meeting with? One of the most important things I think listeners should be aware of when it comes to cross-cultural um, encounters is that professional wardrobe choices send messages. So a clothing selection is a prime example of indirect communication. So when you're choosing what to wear, you want to match the formality and style of those with whom you're meeting. So whenever you come in and you're going to interview with someone and you don't know who's on the other side, you want to make sure that what you wear is going to reflect your best self. And many times, as we discussed a little bit earlier, different cultures look and view the U.S. as one of the most informal cultures worldwide. Globally, we are seen as one of the most informal cultures. So it's a good idea to dress one step above and dress more formally than you ordinarily would. There's a 2015 study entitled The Cognitive Consequences of Formal Clothing. And in that study, researchers found that those who dress formally are more likely to be seen as intelligent, feel more powerful, and create better relationships within the workplace. They're also seen as making better decisions. And so that presentation to someone in a cross-cultural context is going to make a difference. Um, it's, it's going to make an impression on someone who may be from a more formal um, 
culture or someone who has a different power distance. Um, let's say that someone from a different culture has a different power distance in terms of social or social equality, social inequality. In the U.S., we like to think everyone, all men are created equal, all women are created equal, that there's, uh, we don't like inequality at all in the U.S. In other cultures, a lot of cultures, there is hierarchy and they feel comfortable with hierarchy and they want to know where do I fit in that hierarchy? I want to know my position, that I'm comfortable, I don't make any mistakes. So depending on how you dress when you come in for an interview, you're letting people know, here's where I fit in the hierarchy. I see myself as very casual and informal or I see myself as more formal. So you dress for the position you seek. I love you dress that. For the position. Yeah, dress for the position that you want to have, not the position that you have, right? Right. You dress for the to reflect the position you seek, not necessarily the job you hold. Yeah, and I think that just some simple tips. Oh, this is a funny one. Uh, years and years ago, about 15 years ago, when I started recruiting, I used to recruit nationwide. And it was before the days of Skype and iPhones and FaceTimes and all of that. And there was a gentleman who went into interview for an entry-level management position for recent college graduate. And I'll never forget, I got this call from an irate client right after his interview. Jennifer, I cannot believe you sent Jimmy in to interview with us. This is completely inappropriate. You'll never believe what he did. And I was like, oh my God. I'm so sorry, please. And what what happened? And she said, well, Jennifer, Jimmy was not wearing socks with his shoes. I'm like, I, I had to kind of put the phone on mute while I giggled to myself. I was like, I'm, I'm sorry, wait, what? He wasn't wearing socks with his shoes. And this was a job that he really had wanted going in the door. So I put the client on hold. I called Jimmy on the other line. And I said, Jimmy, you know, um, how'd the interview go? And he's like, oh, it went great, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, well, you know, one quick thing. Um, can you tell me, what, were you wearing socks with your shoes? And he said to me, oh, honey, no, I was wearing Gucci shoes. You don't wear socks with Gucci shoes. And I've never laughed so hard in my whole life. And the funny thing is, to this day, any man I've ever met who has worn Gucci shoes actually has told me you don't wear socks with Gucci shoes. But in that particular case, despite the fact that it was a very high level brand, not wearing socks to an interview was such a big deal to this particular culture of this environment that it was a don't pass go uh, sort of a situation. So you really have to be careful because in one sense, you might think, oh, I'm going to be fancy and wear Gucci shoes. And on the other san- sense, this gentleman had lost himself his entry level managerial job that he had wanted. He miscalculated the organizational culture. Exactly. Yep. He, he, mm-hmm. Yes, because this culture within this organization didn't, you know, that they're not, they, at that particular location, Gucci shoes were not something they, that management had an appreciation for or a concept for or wore on a regular basis or wanted to see. They did not want that in their culture. They wanted to have shoes and socks, period. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so that story always cracks me up. But I know a couple of tips here that I know you've shared with me are simple little things for women or for men. For women, you know, just women or men keep it kind of blacks, grays, simple muted colors, nothing too bright or that's going to detract from you or what you're saying in the meeting or what you're saying in the interview. You know, in a man's case, you know, just keeping it very simple, button up shirts, etc. For women, slacks or a nice skirt suit, whatever you prefer. But just I think the key to the game of being professional is having it be just simple but elegant and classy. And my thought on this, though, is is something I would love your opinion on. When I teach people how to network effectively, I go the exact opposite way. So if you're going into an unknown business meeting or an interview, keep it conservative and thoughtful and simple. But if you're going into a networking event, I've always been an advocate of being the most brightly or most interestingly dressed person in the room because then it's a great icebreaker to have people come up and speak to you whether you're a man or a woman I agree with you because the difference between those two events is when you're interviewing or you're looking to get hired for a job the most important thing is your clothing selection contributes to a job search or an interviewing a workplace because they you need to reflect good judgment 
they want to, you want to show them, oh, look, my clothing reflects good judgment. I want you to know that I, I am a trustworthy. You're going to be able to not only do I look competent on paper, but I present myself well. I'm an ambassador for you and your business. And when you send me out as a representative of this organization, I'm your ambassador. But if you're at a networking event, that's, you're not necessarily an ambassador for the organization. You're there to network. You're there to do something a little bit different. And just as you described, then you can show more personality. You can they have a little more initiative and wear pops of color. That's a completely different situation because there it's not a situation where you're being evaluated for your judgment. So I, I agree with you hundred percent. Yeah. And I love this other tip too, that you have on here. I know it made a huge difference for me is considering a wardrobe consultant is one of the tips that you had mentioned. And I think this is so important for several reasons. One, I personally never knew as a woman, I was always wearing the wrong size jacket until one day I did hire a consultant who said, oh, you're an extra small. And I had always been buying my jackets in mediums and never even realized that it made me look a little bit frumpy. And then two is colors. I know you also talk about knowing your best colors. Some of us don't even realize it, but depending on your skin tone, you might be wearing a color that makes you look tired or sick or washed out. And if you don't know what your colors are, you're not going to be able to present as strongly as perhaps somebody who does know and is able to adjust their wardrobe appropriately. That's right, Jennifer. As a blonde, I cannot wear gray. Absolutely cannot wear gray. There are other colors I can wear. I can wear navy. I can wear black. And there are many people who can wear different neutral colors that are fabulous for interviewing. And then once you have a job, then you can look and say, okay, these are colors that I want to wear. These are my favorite. I'd love to wear fuchsia or purple or some of the more, you know, vibrant colors that are still power colors. Red is a fabulous power color. But those are the colors that you want to make sure match with your color and your hair and your characteristics. Um, Some of the other tips that I like to to encourage people to think about are to dress with confidence because you'll work smarter. Um, There's another study that's out there that says your own clothing influences your Hmm. self-perception. That same That same 2015 study says that this was from the SAGE, uh, it's published in the SAGE publications, and whenever you dress confidently, you also project that confidence and you feel more confident in your own work. So that's that's really important to be able to to do that. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I know one thing we didn't touch on as well, but that ties into etiquette, especially cross-culturally, is knowing what sort of handshake is appropriate or knowing, for example, I know my husband does a lot of business in Tokyo, and I think there's a very specific way that you're supposed to bow that shows it's, it's like you have to know exactly how much to bow. In the United States, though, I think the handshake is the equivalent of the bow and having that very light-handed handshake says, oh, I'm not confident versus a too strong of a handshake says, I have something to prove. And so you want to be able to strike that generating kind of that warmth, not only through your hand, but also through eye contact. I think as a a form of etiquette, I'd be curious to know, because I know you wrote the book basically on Asia and that in Asia, perhaps it might not be as appropriate to maintain eye contact. Whereas in the United States, if you're taking any sort of business meeting or any sort of interview, the more eye contact you make, the stronger you come across confident wise, confidence wise. And that there are, that's right. In the U.S., if you are working in a U.S.-based work environment, many U.S. Americans believe that eye contact should be 40 to 60 percent direct eye contact during a conversation. You don't want to have more than 60 percent because if you do, it's seen as too intense. It's too much eye contact, less than about 40 percent eye contact, and people think they're hiding something are not being as truthful as they need to be, but that's in the U.S. Once you get into China or Asia, in Japan, in other countries, eye contact is far less direct. It can even be, in Thailand, it's intermittent, and the eyes are lowered as a sign of respect, and they're not direct eye contact. And it's true in even other 
countries that are very close to us, Mexico, it's similar. Um, when someone who is the boss is speaking or the, the patron, the El Jefe, that you lower your eyes as a sign of respect. And there can be many cross-cultural misunderstandings about that because people think, well, they're not paying attention. They're not listening to me as I'm giving them instructions. And actually, they are listening, but because you're in charge, you're the supervisor or the manager, they're looking down. And the same thing with the handshake. Um, you know, many times people want to meet us halfway. And so we go in Japan to do the 15 or the 30 or the 45 degree bow, and they're reaching out to shake our hands. <laughs> and so you end up, you know, <laughs> which is so nice that everybody's trying to meet each other halfway these days. But, you know, you do the bow and then they bow and then they put their hand out to shake hands. And it's a lot more of a gentle handshake. And it can even be more lingering in some countries such as, as Mexico. But in Asia, it can also sometimes be very light and very brief compared to the U.S. handshake because they haven't been doing the handshake and they don't have the same um, type of importance placed on the handshake that we do. So it was interesting. Oh, no, please, after you. Oh, no, go right ahead. So you were going to say it was interesting about what? Well, I didn't want to interrupt you. I insist you go first and then I'll come back. <laughs> no, it's okay. I was actually going to diverge to a point you had made earlier. So why don't we wrap up the point that we're on now and you can share. And I love this. I see that's, it's so funny. I just was quoted in a Ladders article earlier last week about this, about interrupting and where one person, it, it's something that speaking of etiquette, it, you're very polite to say, oh no, please go first. And as, especially in the United States, we tend to interrupt each other more often than not and just plow ahead to the conversation and I think it's a very beautiful sign of respect across many cultures to not interrupt one another, especially in a business setting or in a meeting. So I think it's brilliant what you just did. <laughs> so back to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, you mentioned Asia, and I received a call to do an interview with an organization, and they wanted to know if... Uh, you know, people talk in the U.S. about, well, we think they're not going to do the bow anymore. You know, the handshake is the way to go. And then I received a call from an organization in Asia. They said, we are doing um, a worldwide survey, and we want to know if in light of all the flu that's occurring in the United States and all the sickness, um, and this was not this year. This was several years ago. We want to know if you think that uh, the U.S. will get rid of the handshake and if you think it will fade out and people will start go to to the bow or the knop because it's so much more um, cleanly and you don't have the bacteria changing exchanging hands and people wouldn't get sick as much and so I said well let me send you a written response to that my immediate response is no because of the cultural customs we have in the U.S. and how much the handshake is involved with that I do not think that is possible, but let me send you, you know, some backup for that. And I said, do you think in your country they would get rid of the bow? And she said, oh, no, absolutely not. We would not <laughs> shake hands. And I said, well, I don't think in the U.S. that um, some of our folks here would be willing to give up a handshake either because I think cultural conditioning runs very deep. Yes. But back to you, please, Jennifer. Well, one thing that it was funny that dawned on me that I had meant to touch on earlier when we were talking about people's impressions of you, there was a great technique that somebody taught me years ago in a program I was in with Landmark Worldwide. And in this program, you were supposed to first look at yourself as an individual and first get clear about yourself and then secondarily yourself in groups and how you interact with people. And then the third tier was to look at how you're perceived by others in the world. And I'll never forget there were these questions that you were meant to ask people, the first of which being, what was your impression of me when we first met? And even if you just ask that particular question, it gives you so much insight uh, into how you're perceived and is how you think you're perceived actually consistent with how others are perceiving and interacting with you. And I just think it's a, given the context of this conversation around etiquette, it can just be very helpful. So I'll give you the other questions as well, um, just because the whole package, I find them to be very helpful and still ask these questions to people every single year 
both acquaintances and professional friends and other people. But the questions are, what was your first impression of me when we met? Where have I surprised you? Where have I disappointed you? What can you count on me for? What can't you count on me for? And what's your impression of me now? And I find that if you ask people and you give them permission to be honest with you, it can really enlighten you and give you some access to things you may not have known about yourself and areas to maybe improve upon in both business and personal settings. Those are excellent questions, and they help people develop a self-awareness, which I think is crucial to self-examine and to get insight from others. Because, you know, we like to take selfies, but then I think sometimes that is what we see in terms of what we think we see. But looking through the lens of someone else at what they see when they look at us, invaluable feedback. Yeah, I think it can be very helpful. Well, that's it. I mean, you've shared so much wonderful feedback today as well. Were there any one or two or maybe three takeaways that you would love the listeners to walk away with today? Yes. I think one of the things that will really help in terms of first impressions and how people are perceived that I find very helpful for me, if you want to dress for power and success, um, I encourage listeners to organize their closets into whatever works for them. I organize mine into work and play. And it doesn't, I don't think it matters how small or tiny your closet is. I still do that, and my friends laugh at me because I have a tiny condo closet, yet I've divided my clothes and my shoes this way because (laughs) I don't ever want to wear my party shoes to the office, and there are many things that I wear to meet clients that I would never wear on the weekends when I go out, so I don't want any confusion. (laughs) So I think organizing closets that way, and then, of course, I'll subdivide into colors and things like that, so... You know, you can really get detailed with that, but I think organizing closets really helps. Number two, I think preparation, and this is a tip taught to me by my mother, and that is prepare for your work week or your business week on Sunday and figure out what am I going to wear this week? Is it all clean? Is it ready for me to wear? And then prepare for the next day, the night before, and pull together what you're going to wear or at least make a list of what to wear and be sure everything's clean and pressed because all those details really matter. And the third thing would be, I encourage listeners to make sure they have a full length mirror installed. So when they dress, they can do a 360 and look and make sure everything is in place. They can analyze themselves and look at themselves as the interviewer, the hiring manager, their very best client would, and then they can kind of ask themselves, when I look at this, do I build trust and inspire respect from their perspective? How will they feel about doing business with me wearing clothes like this? Great advice. Okay. Thank you. Those, Those would be three things I would want to leave the listeners with to think about am I am I putting my best foot forward because once you get a job 85% of that job is based on people skills and soft skills and only 15% of the job is based on your technical skills and your competency it's all about you know how are you getting along and how much of an ambassador are you for the organization and your wardrobe is a huge huge part of that Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Sharon. It's been a pleasure having you on the show today. And I do want to be sure that our listeners know where to find you. If they want more information, they want to pick up your book, where would you recommend that people go to connect with you? They can go to SharonSchweitzer.com and it's S-H-A-R-O-N-S-C-H-W-E-I-T-Z-E-R.com. Or they can find me on Twitter at Sharon Schweitz. And I'm also on Instagram as Sharon Schweitzer. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Sharon, for sharing all of your cross-cultural information and tips on etiquette and wardrobe. I know I learned a thing or two today as well. And thank you so much to everybody who tuned in today. If you missed any portion of today's show, you can find it immediately after the show available in the latalkradio.com archive section under Get Yourself the Job. Or you can find later in the week, the pod, the show will convert to podcast format, and you can find it on iTunes in the podcast section under Get Yourself the Job. We also have a Get Yourself the Job page on Facebook. We encourage you to like us, leave us comments, leave us feedback. We always appreciate any feedback or Uh, comments that you might have or subjects that you would like to hear more about. And as always, thank you so much for tuning in today. And thank you to our sponsor, Markham Search, for sponsoring today's show. And tune in next week, Monday at 4. Thank you again. You're listening to Get Yourself the Job with Jennifer Hill, only on LA Talk Radio. 